Good morning, Sabbath School. Morning, brethren. Morning to our brethren watching the line as well. Welcome to the Holston Church of God uh, Sabbath School, where we seek to expound the Word of God. As been consistent for the last quarter, we have been teaching from home evangelism, the title of the quarterly, and we are on the final lesson in the quarter, uh, and. 13 Sabbath. The lesson, the final lesson says, my house for the service of God. My house for the service of God. And we know um, from previous studies that we've been doing, we've been studying about how we should go about evangelizing. And the central theme or the central component of the study or the various studies has been how we utilize or mobilize our homes into the service of evangelizing. I'm sure that many of us would probably have mixed feelings or mixed thinking about opening up our houses in many ways, but I would like to think that after this series of study, that we are at least one step further in believing that it's doable and it's something that we should do. It's the opposite that seems to be normalized, where we seems to think that uh, the concept of following Christ is just meeting once a week in the physical church building, and that's it. No more contacts for the rest of the week. I need to improve on that. No more um, uh, bonding with the brethren, and no more seeking to, exp um, what do you call it, to grow that group. So we need to reach out to more friends, more people, and less of the... Bible bashing, as the saying goes, and more of um, doing what Jesus done, meeting people at their point of need in their life, and sooner or later they'll realize what keeps you going. The power behind what you do happens to be the Word of God. Amen? And we seek no glory from it, and we seek no other purpose but to do what Jesus done. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back uh, to Sabbath School. Okay, the first... Memory verse is taken from Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. So anyone who has that memory verse or could read it for us, morning and welcome back, <laughs> Gladys. Well, I see um, you've joined us again. Okay, Brother Leo, if you grab the microphone and um, share the memory verse for us. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Choose for yourself this day who you, who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, verse 15. Amen. Cheers. Thank you, Brother Leo. I'll implore those of you watching online if you could share the link on the Bible, various Bible study groups as well. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Leo. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, says Joshua. Uh, anyone who wants to comment on the title of the study or on the memory verse so far? Those of you watching online, feel free to write in on any platform that you're on, and hopefully we'll read out your various comments from the media corner. Anyone, wait for a microphone and you share with us, please. If you just wait for the microphone, Brother Ronald. Sister Laverne, if you could get um, a quarterly and um, a Bible for us, please. Hopefully I understand what, um, what you said. Uh, good, okay. good morning, everyone. Good morning, Brother Ronald. When you said to comment on what the, um, the title... Is that what you mean? Yes, the title or the memory verse. So Joshua chapter 24 or the title of the study, which is it My says, House for the When it says, choose for yourself, mm -hmm. this day you will serve. Right? But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We have that choice, whether you serve him or not. And if God is for us, who will be against us? Yeah, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, I with the Lord. Okay. I have no choice, yes? I don't want this oxen in my life, and I don't wish that on anybody else. My name is love, not hate. Okay, thank yeah. you, Brother Ronald. <laughs> I like the first word you started with, and the first word the memory verse started with as well. It says choose. So it's an active choice. Choose. And if you look later on in the New Testament, which we'll turn to as the study pro progresses, it's a choice. Choice. I want us to get that. that. It's a choice. There are many religions now that will chop your head off or chop your hands off if you don't uh, act according to what they tell you. But it's a choice. And it's very important we understand why it's a choice as well. We'll explore some of these themes later. 
but it's very important that we understand it's a choice. If you look at the background of um, Joshua, Israel was just coming out of a um, lot of pagan practices and pagan settings. If you read Joshua chapter 24, and Joshua had to make a stand to say, people need to make their minds up. Does that make sense? People have to make their minds up as to where they want to be, what they want to do, and how they want to go about their life. Morning, uh, good morning. So, so people have to choose, choose, it's a choice. Anyone else want to comment on the memory verse or the title? Okay, if you wait for the microphone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Blessed Sabbath, Sister Laverne. For me, um, it's a title, my host for the service of God. Um, this can be the physical house that you're living in and also your art. Okay, your body. Um, yeah, uh, the physical yeah. house is that you um, open your house, welcome person there to have service with them. Like you gather with your brother or sister, and even mm -hmm. with your neighbor, and you like have service within your house. And within your body, now your heart, that's where the service of God, your heart is supposed to be clean, it's supposed to love where the, um, the service of God begins. So once you have love within, within you, then that light would actually pour out to persons that are out there in need who need to know about Christ. So your body, as I said, can also be the house of God. Okay, or is the house of God as well. Thank you, Sister Laverne. So Sister Laverne has unified the physical body and the spiritual service as well. Thank you, Sister Laverne. So everyone's on point so far. So I expect maximum participation as we progress. So, okay, yes. Hello, happy Brother Sabbath. Said, yes, go on. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Blessed Sabbath, Brother Said. Um, this verse just reminded me of um, when Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Okay, interesting. Yeah, where he says that uh, you can't serve both God and mammon. Mm -hmm. And we know that mammon means um, or is representation of the God of wealth, mm -hmm. for example. So it's like we can't serve wealth and God. Not necessarily that we can't be wealthy, but more so just that we can't make our sole concern about wealth. So if we're opening up our houses to people, we should make sacred that time in which we can kind of allow people to come into our house and then we can kind of dedicate time to share the word mm -hmm. and kind of break bread with one another. Very good. And uh, there's just one one thing that I was wanting to read out from yes, a cool. book called The Sabbath by Abraham Heschel, where he's talking about the Sabbath. Okay, it's just go on. on, he says, there's a realm of time where the goal is not to have, but to be, not to own, but to give, not to control, but to share not to subdue, but to be in accord. Life goes wrong when we, when the control of space, the acquisition of things of space becomes our sole concern. So what, can, what that teaches me is that there's, during the week, sometimes we kind of feel as though it's all about work, all about work. But we need to kind of actually make sacred certain times in which we kind of say, it's not about what we gain, but what we can give, what we can share. Okay, very good. That's a very powerful point, by the way. And if you, set aside that space as you said it becomes sacred you see it as equivalent to going to church or equivalent to the sabbath so and i like that quote that you or the various quotes that you done from the passage of reading just now as well is that everything seems to have that paradox in terms of if if you want to gain you have to lose so as jesus would put it if you want to if you want to rise you have to first go lower mm -hmm. as he did he literally went in the heart of the earth yeah. before he ascended so says Psalm 68 as well. And he says, who is greatest amongst you? He who serves. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the same sort of, it challenges us in the opposite of life because many people, they want wealth, they want to achieve, but they don't see breaking bread and fellowship in his, and, and such things as achievement. Thank you, Brother Said. And I'll implore us, as Brother Said said just now, that we um, set aside or be consistently setting aside time to serve because you can't, serve the system of wealth or mammon and serve God. As Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. So you have to decide which one you see as priority. Does that make sense? Where energies lie, where you're, I mean, for example, we spoke about this sometimes before. I'll come back to you in a minute, Brother Said. We spoke about this many times before, where the work week, everyone's on time for work. Because you know there's consequences, you know there is, um, um, a reason why, because ultimately, if you can't keep the paycheck coming in, you're going to be out of a house or, you know, whatever. But when it comes to Sabbath, everyone just sees it as, oh, well, it's just another holiday. Do you see what I'm saying? So you, you're right in what you said. Brother Said, go on. Yeah, also I was going to say um, another thing that you just reminded me of is um, 
about priorities is where Jesus mm -hmm. says, um, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. So like I said, it's not about, when he says you can't serve one, uh, two masters, it's not necessarily saying that you can't be wealthy. He's saying that the wealth will come, but <laughs> the priority needs to... I like you get a jail card there, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> you find no, print. No, no, because a lot of people think it's either that you have to... No, no. I, yeah, I know I, what you mean. I know, I know exactly what you mean. Um, as, as he says, seek ye first, Matthew 6, all these things shall be added from chapter 5 to chapter 6. All these things will be added. Solomon, richest and wisest man who ever lived, was a testimony to this. So God, we have to understand that wealth or money or uh, material possessions is not a dirty concept. It's the creator who actually gives it to us for his glory. Amen? But it's just when we seek to exalt that above all else, and that's where the problems lie. And it's... Um, Timothy chapter um, 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells you a lot of people. Do you want to go there if you could bring that up for us? 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'll just interject that quickly as I think it's relevant to what we're speaking about. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, or is it? Yeah. Let's start from verse 6. Oh, there, first Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. In other words, you value that as great gain. It's something to be valued. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there, therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root the love is the energy where you choose to serve where your body serves where your mind serves where everything absorbs you the love of money is the root of all, all evil for which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced himself through with many sorrows i could just stop there but the word is drawing a distinction there between uh having something and being lustful for it will do anything to get it where you just become absorbed by it. So I want us to understand the differentiation we're talking about in serving this morning. Thank you for the various contributions. Thank you, Brother Said, for um, rounding that off for us as well. All right, the objective of this morning's lesson is to reflect on how home meetings are a useful strategy for the proclamation of the gospel. So it's to reflect on how home meetings are useful strategy for the proclamation of the gospel. Does that make sense? So we're trying to see why meeting in anyone's house is to be seen as just as important, if not far more important, than physical church meetings only. Does that make sense? In fact, do you not find it very interesting that God calls his church the house of God? His house, isn't it? Israel is called the house of Israel. Do you not see these parallels? It's always seen as a house. As Sister Laverne said just now, God's vision of our bodies and our minds is seen as the house or the temple. Does that make sense? So it's, 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 it's to be um, observed. Brother Ronald. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not using the mic. At the moment, no, it'd be important that you use the mic because. The brethren online can't hear you. So, yep, thank you. Good morning. Morning. At the moment, when he was talking like that, it just gave me, um, you know when he said it's vital sometimes where we have house studies as well? Yes. But who's the comforter? Who's the it, comforter? Yeah, the comforter comes, yes. If one can't do it alone. Absolutely. So sometimes you, you come, the, the Lord, you understand when I said comforter? Yes, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Lord said, yes. You say we will come with a com yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you open your door at the right time, yeah, you have the comforter. We can't sit down and reason now, mm -hmm. yeah, because that's what we need sometimes. That's all of a sudden it just come to me like that. I hope you know. No, no, no. You, do you right. understand when no, I'm no, saying it I'm, like that? I'm, when you're sitting down alone sometime mm -hmm. and somebody talk to you on the phone or something, mm -hmm. right, and I'm talking um, common sense, or, yeah, our reasoning, yeah, it's the comforter saying. Of course. Okay. Of course. No, no, you're absolutely right. Look what happened to Philip. Um, look what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch. It was the Holy Spirit that moved Philip to 
the Gaza Strip to actually speak to the Ethiopian eunuch that was reading the book of Isaiah that didn't understand it. So everything that we do, and if you look at previous studies as well, everything, that's why everything needs to start with prior, that the Holy Spirit goes before you. And in everything that you see in, in scripture, God sends his Holy Spirit long before you actually physical enter the scene. So we have to understand that even at creation as well, it says the spirit moved up on the face of the deep. It takes the move of God's spirit, the comforter, long before you could invite someone home. I'll give you an example. You could meet a homeless person or a beggar or someone that you see as less in need or more in need than many people in society. Many of us would just be happy to just give them a sandwich or just give them money and just call it a day because it's just easy to do that. But how many of us would do a more meaningful engagement with them in terms of, okay, they probably live local, that you could say, look, I'll meet you here again tomorrow. Or as time progresses, say, come home for a cup of tea, have a shower in my house. It needs the Holy Spirit. See, I see laugh and face, looks and faces like you'd be crazy. No, but it needs the Holy Spirit to go before you to protect you in that scenario because many of us would see it as crazy to bring someone home but if god goes there brethren i'm telling you it's just for us to as uh, sooner or later adjust our thinking but uh, would you yes. give them their shoes if they're asking for your shoes well uh, that would be very challenging i've done that i, I, I couldn't well, believe it the man not okay. my don't ask me, ask me for a pair of shoes mm. i couldn't believe it i thought it was a setup but i just give my pair of shoes well, that's fine well there you go pastor johnson gave an example where i was in saint lucia preaching or a caribbean country or Tobago, I think it was Tobago. And um, he said in the sermon, a guy asked him for his jacket and he said, yeah, after the sermon. So he thought that it was just a joke. And then after the sermon, he literally came in and said, no, 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 <laughs> we need a jacket now. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? And he had to give him his blazer. All right, let's, let's move further forward. Thank you, Brother Ronald. Um, okay, yes, go on, Sister Joan. Okay, go on, quick point. As much as the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. As the Holy the Spirit, um, moved upon Philip, mm -hmm. yeah? He also mo uh, moved upon the Ethiopian eunuch. Absolutely. It's a two-way street. It's, absolutely. I just wanted to point that out. No, absolutely. That's how the spirit works. And that's why we shouldn't do anything out of emotions or do anything out of um, impulse because we could get it so badly wrong, so badly wrong. In fact, um, you'll see later on in the study where when Jesus said, go, you see a man go prepare the upper room for the Passover. We'll discuss that later on. And you see a donkey, let them release it, and we need it for the master's use. You see that later on. You see where it takes the Holy Spirit to work on both sides of the fence. Because you can't just turn up to someone and say, look, we're going to um, requisition that donkey, or we need, we need a room in the house to do something. Do you see what I'm saying? It need the Holy Spirit to have gone there before, to have um, softened that person's mind. It's just a bit like when you go um, for a job interview. You need to pray before you turn up. Because I'm telling you, brethren, I'm sure you experienced this before. All you want to you know is a wrong person to meet you. Have you ever been to the council? And all you want is just someone behind that glass screen to don't like the state of you or what you said. Or you just use one wrong word that could trigger that person. Or that person could have had a bad experience that morning. And they're going to, anyone they meet, they're going to meet it. They're going to get it. Do you see what I'm saying? Or even that as well. So there's so much prejudice or unkindness that's in society that if, they, if that person decide or a police officer decide that somebody going to get it this morning, it could be you. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It, it's possible. So I'm just saying to you that God would have already gone. Look what happened to Pilate and his wife. God would have already spoken to that person in a dream or a vision the morning before. They would have given him a good night's sleep give them a good experience, that by the time you encounter that person, it's already a match made in heaven. Does that make sense? So it's, it's very important, Brother Ronald, that the comfort, as you said, goes before. All right, introduction. Who's going to bless us with the reading of, of the introduction? Okay, Sister Joan. <laughs> the Lord. Okay. Hallelujah. Introduction. Go on. Right, so we're on lesson 13, my house for the service of God. Amen. Introduction. In the New Testament, we find distinct references to people's home, oinkus in Greek, and the evangelistic work done there. Matthew, Luke 5, 27, 31. Cornelius, Acts 
10, 24, Lydia, Acts 16, 11, 15, Crispus, Acts 18, 8, Zacchaeus, Luke 19, 1 to 10, and Lazarus, John 11, 20 to 31. This, the disciples also met in houses. The outpouring of the Spirit happened in a house, Acts 2, 2. The disciples had um, coinus. Well, let's pronounce that again. The disciples had cornea, sharing goods, having communion and fellowship at home. They taught publicly and at home. So that says they taught publicity and at home. The customs of gathering in private houses were widely practiced for the first three centuries of church history. While dedicated places of worship are known from the third century, it was not until the fourth um, after the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the empire that by his policy and example, uh, the relatively simple worship accommodation of earlier times gave way to the construction of large and lavish churches. Churches that have experienced large growth have adopted house meetings as a strategy for the evangelistic work. The majority of believers came to the church through a family member or friend. So why not make the most of these strategies? Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. People are more are more likely to accept the invitation to meet in homes, feeling more at ease in praising and participating in activities conducted by those commissioned for outreach. Believers develop their spiritual gifts more in this setting as well. The feeling that comes from a full church building that we have finished the task is also avoided. New believers will always have space in their homes to continue inviting others. When believers practice meeting at home, the lack of a church building will not be a motive for idleness. The family is the smallest social group organized and blessed by God from the very beginning. Like a cell in the human body, it is for the foundation for the organization of society. The family group is like a branch, which in order to survive must remain attached to the tree or church. It is in family groups where communion or konoina can best be practiced. This Greek term denotes solidarity, a close and intimate association. This word is found in Acts 2, 42, 47, and describes the lifestyle of the community of believers in the church. And they continued steadfastly in apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. The three activities listed in this verse produce fellowship, doctrine, breaking bread, and prayer. Such, communi such, communi such communion in the early church produced the following effects. Fear of God, signs and wonders, unity of the disciples, financial contributions, fulfilled needs, mass gatherings, home gatherings, sharing food, worship and praise, acceptance, and God's blessing for the growth. Let's look at six essential components of the early church according to Acts 5.42. Continuous ministry daily, mass gatherings in the temple, home gatherings in every house, dedicated ministries did not cease, consistent evangelism, uh, teaching and preaching, solid foundation jesus christ amen. amen praise the lord thank you gladys and sister joan thanks a lot for i'm reading the introduction those of you watching online uh, if it's not on the screens i apologize however i hope that you're um, following as well all right there's some key points that's popping out of the introduction and i hope that someone will pick up on them as well all right let's look at some interesting points here that was first done within our household. So we know the introduction was Joshua being able to say that as for me and my house. So 
we see a slight different shade of meaning of house than what we've been talking about. Because we see house as just a physical environment. What we see when he says me and my house, he's not talking about him and the physical brick house. He's talking about who? The tribe, the, tribe, the family, the people. Do you see? So he's saying that not only him, but the people that he's in charge of as well. Or we could see a different shade of mean of house here. In other words, good governance. Does that make sense? If I should put it in a familial context, we could see where a father is in control of his household. Does that make sense? We could see where someone could say that, as for me and the people that's with me, I could speak on their behalf, that they will serve as well. So I want us to understand where Joshua made a statement. It was made in the context of family. Does that make sense? In the context of not just a one man and his band or one man and his um, single family, single father only or single person only, but he was speaking on behalf of another group of people or the rest of the group wider. The tribe that he represents is physical family that he represents as well. So I want us to see house in that context. Now, it's important why? Because um, there's some rules for I'm um, even taking office within the church that your household must be in a good state even before you talk about opening it to other people. Does that make sense? I mean, imagine if you have a dysfunctional household or a dysfunctional group of people living under one roof. It'd be very difficult to invite someone in for, <laughs> for, for a cup of tea because you haven't even paid the electric bill or you haven't even washed the dishes. Does that make sense? So even the ability to say that you could invite anyone to your house shows that you as a singular person, as a group of people within the household, you must be a testimony to stability. Does that make sense? So even starting from the household, or from as for me and my house, it's already speaking volumes as to what the Word of God has done for you. Because many people could gather in church and they hide under the big group of people, isn't it? But when you say, you remember when Jesus turned up to seek out his disciples, they asked him, where do you live? Do you remember? Because they wanted to know, they were curious. You talk about his kingdom and this big curiosity. But fortunately, the son of man didn't have any house for anyone to judge him by. But everyone was still curious as to, where do you live? And he made this famous phrase that says, foxes have all, as such a birds of nest, but the son of man have nowhere to live. A question for you, brethren. If you found a Christian in today's society and he's homeless, what would you think of that person? In one word or one sentence, what do you think? If you found a Christian in church and they say they're homeless, what do you think? Well, or one sentence, what do you think? Okay, Brother Said, go on. I have a couple words. I'll say okay, unstable, unstable, unreliable. Unstable, unreliable, okay, All right. <laughs> No, 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 brother. Bro, okay, brother, Ronald, this agrees. Okay, hold on a bit. Excuse me. One, one second, brother, Ronald. Okay, one second, brother, Ronald. Okay. No, no, no. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Wait, no. It's, it's a Sabbath school, so we expect to have different views and different opinions. One second. One second. We'll come to you, brother, Ronald. We'll ask brother Said to expound on that. Brother Said, you know what? what do you think? No, it's not. Um. <laughs> Don't withdraw your answer. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Unstable. The reason why is because mm -hmm. people see houses as stability. Okay. So if you, like, for example, even with, um, even if you look through the Old Testament, mm -hmm. when they're trying to, let's say, if you talk about the tabernacle, it's a portable house of God, for example, mm -hmm. then they try to make a, a house that's out of brick and it stays in one place. Oh, permanent, yeah. And it's permanent and it's, it sticks in one place. It's reliable. We know it's here. We can go we to, it. to find it. We know where to find it. Mm -hmm. And they always go travel up to Jerusalem to the house of God. That's where it is. Mm -hmm. So that's wh why I say stable. They see it as stable. Okay. And also, the reason why, let's say, for example, when Jesus says there's not going to be a stone upon this temple, it's kind of like he's trying to challenge them not to rely so much on the physical building for their worship. Okay. He's it's trying to... who they are as a people. Like. Yes. Okay, I get you. So it's, it's a thing with human beings, and even in general, like with everyone, it's like when we see a house or 
we want to build a house or anything, it's stability, it's, it's stable, it's, it's what one it place. Represents, it's what it represents, more yes. than just the physical bricks. More than just the physical Very well explained, very well explained. Don't say about your answer, very well explained. Brother Ronald, let's hear your different views. Thank you, Brother Saeed. No, when I said it wasn't fair, I was talking mm -hmm. about the homeless part, when you ain't got nowhere, mm -hmm. and you're out on the road, and you're sleeping on the street. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you never know what tomorrow will bring. I always used to think them people with tramps, or vagrants mm -hmm. until okay. I was in that same position. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just got so, but it's a learning stage. I'm glad you said yeah. learning because come back to what Brother Saeed says, and that's why no one should be offended by what he said, because he's absolutely right. If as a child of God that you daily have no way to live, it's a sign of instability and we have to, the truth is absolute. If we don't say as it is, then we will encourage our people to make wrong choices. So we have to say it as, as it is. It's a God-given right. Look, when God made the garden, we're making man, the first place he did was make a place for them. Isn't it? Jesus Christ in his prophecies says, Behold, I've gone to prepare a place for you, that there where I am you may be also in my Father's house, your many mansions. Let's not adopt this new belief that it's okay and circumstances. It's not. That's not God's plan for his people. His plan for his people that you are stable, you have a house, you have a dwelling, you have somewhere to raise a family, you have um, somewhere to expound his gospel or invite others to as well. And you have somewhere to rest and recuperate. That's God's plan for you. So let's not adopt this new belief that it seems like it's optional. Because um, part of the new world government system as well is where they tell you that they don't, they don't want you to own anything. They want you just to subscribe only where they could keep you moving and kick you out tomorrow and keep you moving. It's a sign of instability and an unstable system. Believe me. So Brother Said is right. Um, we'll go to Sister Liz and Sister Joan. We'll have to go back to the key, key points. Okay, we'll come back to you in a minute, Sister Joan. Sister Liz. <laughs> You're starting the Me Too campaign now, all right? Okay. No, no, go on, go on. Go I on. totally don't understand Brother Saeed's quest answer to the question of okay. um, a homeless person, um, a child of God being homeless. Mm -hmm. um, you said it's a state of instability. I mean, Unreliable. because because, uh, because the but, first thing you said mm. was that the Lord Himself did not have a physical house. And then people will say, well, if your master, whom mm -hmm. you're serving, I mean, don't have a physical house for mm -hmm. himself, I mean, not that we should take that to say, well, but I, I was basically would say, maybe the person's having a hard time or maybe your time don't come yet. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what we do. We look at a person's within the body. And that's why a lot of people basically don't maybe come in the fellowship because the first thing we do is to look to see um, what job you've got. I don't know. What... We're not judging people in that context. We're making but, a well, wider if, point. If you, just under, if you just explain how is it uh, okay. Let's instability explain. for poor, uh, a child of God. So basically what we're saying is that a child of God cannot not lack no, 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 no. Oh, hold on a minute. Maybe I'm getting oh, it wrong. I don't know. I don't Maybe we're reading too far into this because I don't want us to divert and spend too much time on this. Maybe I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to Brother Said in a minute. Let's just cl clear two points here. Let let's clear two points here. Let's clear two points here. One, Jesus clearly grew up in a stable setting with Mary and Joseph as his mom, right? So clearly family setting. We knew when Jesus couldn't be found, his mother and father, when searching for him, they found him in the temple, etc. So we know that he grew up in a stable setting. He, however, and I'm not talking son of God, son of man only now. He, however, as he said, his meat or his daily bread became the service of God. He clearly took a decision that he stepped away from the dwelling place setting where he didn't choose no earthly living. Some cultures even do that now. You probably call it nomadic. But we're not talking about people that's taken that kind of step, for example. Or if we go one step further, we're not talking people that's down on the luck. That's circumstantial. I'm talking about if someone's in the faith of God for years and years, for example, or even just come to God, and if you don't believe God for giving you, I could give you loads of examples from Bible where this is concerned, by the way, where God even prophesies this in um, the book of James and Peter, that until you get your own or your own place to have your own food, you're not in a stable place. Simple reason being, number one, is that if you don't believe God for a house, 
which is part of your daily bread, believe it or not, then the question would become, what are you asking God for then? Or if that person is happy in their own situation, then what would you be asking God for? Sister Liz, if someone is homeless and they don't see a problem with that, wouldn't you be very curious? Um, it's a different, it's a different turn. It's a different turn of the question okay. now because the person... Well, it's not a different turn because... because oh, one, sir, second, one second, let's back up a bit. If this is saying to us that we need to invite people to our houses and express mm. the gospel there, and no one has no house to take you to to express the gospel, don't you see that it's at odds with the lesson? Yeah, but the thing about it is not all of the bridging homes that we're going to go to. We're going to select for the homes that are able to open up because if that, that exactly that can accommodate the, the worship or the fellowship, really. maybe we're going to be, because if we look here, there are certain homes that are, open up in the Bible too. So we go to, say for instance, Sister um, uh, Sandra's home, because it's more convenient for worship, a fellowship, and we go and we gather there. It doesn't mean you're going to have to come to my house. What if I don't have a home? One what if I'm living with with right. um, Sister Jane, Let's... and um, <laughs> and the Lord so happened, uh, look at it this way, the Lord so happened to have it for the saving of my soul that I have to be close to to brother uh, Leo, Leo, just and the Lord don't and I'm looking at it as as I I I oh she don't have but it's just for the saving of my soul. Peradventure, I ask the Lord for something else and I'll branch out. I might lose my my no. my faith my way no, no, no. because I've seen it happen no. and I've seen yes. where people <laughs> have got a lot mm -hmm. and when they come to the house to, to know the Lord, all that are taken away from no, them. No, no, no. Sister, I don't know if I'm, I probably get no, no, no. Well, Look, let, let me be definitive as a Sabbath school teacher. Let me let me take order of the lesson now. Right? No, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Because in the interest of time, we have to move further forward. But let, let's, let, I'm going to sum it up in one word, right? Or one sentence. It's God's plan that we all do not lack. That's the plan of God. There's no other way you could mix it or pretty it up or try to put it in a way that to say, let's be less judgmental about it. There's no other way. Because let me tell you something very straight and simple. Let me tell us something straight and simple. Whatever is going on in your life, if you're lacking a house or daily bread or the ability to feed yourself, you automatically become someone else's problem. It's the word of God. Let's go to let's go to um, First Timothy chapter five. Let's go to First Timothy chapter five. In fact, the word tells us likewise. Look, let's look at even more basic. One second. I'm in teaching mode now, brother. Now, one second. Let's look at it more basic. The word tells you likewise. If a man don't provide for his household, he's worse than what? An infidel. It means that he's denied the power of God totally as an entity upon his life. That's what the word says. So th there's no, and this is this is a trick of the, this is the, I'm coming to the hands in a minute. I'm, I'm looking at the hands, but let me just expound a little bit further. There's no system or setup that could tell me that it's okay or seems rational or put it like this, in its most basic form, no matter where you live, if it's even in one little room in a house, bed sit or whatever, you must have the capacity to share. So you can't say that her house is more convenient. In other words, what we're saying by this lesson then is that this only applies to some people who has big house. No, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying that you're saying that. I'm saying that that's what the logic gonna boil down to, where your house is more convenient than mine. I'm saying that this word is challenging us. Believe me, it's, it's a challenging lesson. This word is challenging us that no matter your circumstance. You must have the capacity, the willingness, the inclination to open your doors and share, no matter which way. Even if it's a car. Even if it's a car. Even if it's a car. Absolutely right. You know what you could do? Even, absolutely. Even if it's under a tree, wherever. In fact, my dream is to live in a camp, in a, in a, in a no, seriously, in a mud hut, in nature. My dream, but it won't stop me from expounding or expressing or opening it up to to someone else. Okay, I saw the hands. Let me just take the points. I won't comment on them. Sister Joan, brother side, and sister, and sister <laughs> no, no, brother and all, I saw your hand, but then, <laughs> okay, all the brethren, let's start with Sister Joan. We'll, we'll come yeah, back I, to you I, in a minute, Sister Diane. I, I hear you, and I okay. do understand what brother, brother side said, and you mm -hmm. said to a degree, but I have a friend, and, and well, I, she's not in a car now, but she was living in her car, but that didn't make her unstable or 
unreliable. She was happy. She was happy in the Lord. She was stable in the Lord. And why, she why was didn't okay. She, why didn't she stay in that situation then? Um, no, well, she moved on from that situation. But, but, but why? Because, because um, of course she wants to get a stable setup. She wants to get a house. But she was her. stable before that, no, even when I, she was I, in I her car. That, yeah, okay, that's fine. Even when she was in her car, I, I she felt that, she was stable. Okay, I find that, listen, we, we could narrow this down into many opinions or views, but I find it very hard to believe that someone would... Um, uh, no, no. One, one second. I'm not calling, I'm not calling living a car or living in a wagon or, or a mobile home. Um, homeless necessarily. I'm talking about someone who desires to live in a house and don't have the house. They are a homeless person that's an unstable situation. Believe me, and many other factors stem from that as well. We talk about health issues. We talk about mental issues. We talk about even spiritual issues. We talk about, um, for example, uh, we talk about the, just the stability that you, we know where to find the person should you need to contact them. You talk about even saying to the person, I've, I've dealt with so many of these scenarios where you even say to the person, okay, I'll meet you next week. They don't even know where they're going to be next week. Do you see what I'm saying? They don't even know. If, if the weather changes, they don't even know if they could keep the car running to keep warm enough. I'm telling you, these, believe me, let's, we're sister lover and I can't take no new additional points. One second, one second, I have to go. Okay, I'll let you share your testimony in a minute. Um, on the microphone. Thank you, Sister Joan. Let's go back to Brother Saida. We go back to um, Brother Ronald, Sister Diane, and Sister Laverne. Now I'll let, I'll let um, Sister Laverne go. Okay, we give away. Okay, he gave away to you. Okay, I'm uh, My microphone, please. I've been in, let's say, wasn't homeless, but almost homeless situation yes. right before I actually um, came in this church. Last year, this time, I was in an emergency um, accommodation, right? Even though I was comfortable, everything was being provided for me. I wasn't stable in that situation. I left, I like elevate, I went into a next situation. Things were being provided for me, but I still wasn't stable in that. So, um, so you wasn't homeless, but you but, still were homeless. Yes, <laughs> mindset, I was still homeless. I had to leave because I wanted to work. That's simply me. No, I'm at a place nowhere. I can work. I can do whatever I want. I want. So certain situation, you're not stable, even though you can open your place to a person. You're not stable in Stick it. Stick a pin right there. Stick a pin right there. If someone, Sister Joan just said mindset. Thank you, Sister Laverne. Mindset. If you, for example, you want a job and they want to write to you. Where's the address to write to? Talk to me, Reverend. Talk to me. Your auntie, the, oh, so you, you're relying on someone else's domestic setup now for your, this is what I'm saying, you immediately become someone else's problem. I'm sure you understand me, Reverend, but we'll take the last two points, then we have to move forward. I've opened a can of worms, but it's important that we discuss it, Sister. Okay. Sister Diane, Sister Diane, I know. But, oh, okay, mine is very okay. simple and okay, go quick. On. I think maybe it's the way you ask the question, okay. because you just said um, about address and if they want to write you. But that's, mm. that's only applicable in a Western country because you know back home, like in the Caribbean and so, everybody let us go to the home post office. And you so go that, pick it up from there. Yeah, you pick it up from there. Whether you have address mm. or not, just say mm. your name and that post office. Mm. Yeah, but what I was gonna make a point to is um, the first scripture that you have on the, on the board. Um, Godliness with contempt is great gain. So if you have God, you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't have house or land or nothing. You no. have God within yes. yourself, it's yeah. great gain. Absolutely. Houses, um, yeah. place where you live, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter where you work, it doesn't matter, you have God. That is great gain. What is bigger than a great gain? No, you're absolutely right where that's concerned, but let's not get it twisted. Right. If we're gonna put cultural dynamics in it, which I agree with you, but if we put cultural dynamics in it, let's get this straight. Let's get this absolutely straight, brethren. In some cultures, as you alluded to just now, the people that live that life, they live somewhere. And that somewhere has to be either a piece of land you own or a piece of land the family owns. You can't just not live nowhere and, not, not, and survive. How would you survive? It's, 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 not, it's not God's design for you. It's, it's not a done thing. I'm not talking about you have to have a house like the Western idea of a household like that. I'm talking about homelessness in the sense where you are no abiding city. You can't even have the basic where the word of God could function in terms of having a space to share with someone. The people that lives in a, in a nomadic setting. Uh, 
Okay, so here's a question for you. Just, just let's take one question from Sister Diane. Then we, we go to the final point from Brother Said, seeing that he started this controversy. I'm blaming you. I'm joking. But um, <laughs> Sister, Sister Diane, on the microphone, let's ask you this simple question. Yeah. A person in any culture that doesn't live in a house or in any setting or in any, in any location, right? Yeah. Where would they live? A person who don't have any settings. Any house. Yeah. In any culture, where would they live? They would live where they, where they stay. Maybe at the where? street side, maybe at a bus stop, maybe in the park, maybe at, on a piece of land. They would have somewhere that and they sleep at night and, and they lay their head. How do they cook and eat? They, they Restaurant. It's not restaurant. Like, that's yes, a, that's yes. A, and, and that's an oxymoron there. Homeless person yeah, eating a restaurant. Especially in, in the Caribbean country, you can make firewood anywhere you, start, you stay. And, I've seen homeless people cooking on the roadside. And you think that that's the wish for God upon no, anyone's No, but that's life. what I say. Those people are not in their right mind. So you Okay, not in yeah. the right... I misheard that bit. I understand, you know. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. No, no, no. Thanks for clarifying. You said not in the right mind. Sometimes the Okay, all right, Reverend. Final yes, point. I agree. Final I point. Agree. Final point. Thank you, Sister Diane. Let's, let's yes. give it to Brother right. Side. Yeah. Final point. Okay. Uh, thanks okay. for clarifying that point. Okay. okay, so Brother Zayed. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that that word was gonna. Yeah, no, I didn't know that that word was gonna cause so much um, controversy. But what I was trying to say is that this is also human perception. People perceive things in such a way where if they don't see that this person's stable, it makes it harder for the gospel. It, yes. So it also, even with this church, for example, if we didn't have, let's say, if we didn't have a church building that we met up every Sabbath, and we said, okay, we're gonna have to change it every single week. People will get tired of that. True. Because people love stability. Or I'm not saying that yeah. this is necessarily only where God is. I'm saying that this is where what people perceive. And so for example, if we were to change the house setting every week and say, oh, it's in East London, oh, it's in North London, oh, it's in South London, people get tired of that. People like stability, no, people, people like to know, okay, this is where I can find it. But that's what even even Jesus did say that there's no, not going to be a temple or there's not going to be like, uh, what did he say? The true worshippers aren't going to worship on this mountain or the true worshippers aren't going to worship on the house, in this house because the, the, the bricks cast the, down. Yeah, exactly. So what he's trying to tell us is that don't get attached to these things because that's not necessarily where the house of God is going to be. But human beings love stability. That's what he's trying to say. But he's trying to say, what Jesus is trying to say is that we have to grow accustomed to let go of these things. And let me give a, a comment on Facebook said, okay, let's, don't let's, you think let's, that God let's, lowers let's, some people, some people's standard to rise them up after? That's not what, I'm not trying to say that's the opposite of what I'm saying. I'm not trying to say that that's not what he tried to do. For example, with Job, he had all the stability in the who, world. Who made that comment online, please? It's Julie Charles. Okay, Julie, Julie Charles. Charles. Yeah, so I'm not saying that God doesn't lower people down or humble people down and make them... Um, go through all these situations. What I'm trying to say is that if you're talking about human perception and how they see things, they would want stability. They would want a house. They would want somewhere they can constantly go to. That's Amen. what I'm saying. Amen. I see, oh my gosh, I see so many hands. All right, Reverend, Reverend. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Brother Said. Right, okay. Promise me this, Reverend. That after these singular points, we'll have to move on. Does that make sense? We open a can of worms here, right? And I pray that God's blessing upon everyone's life, that we have some stability, somewhere we could call home, somewhere we could lay our head, somewhere we could invite me over for a meal, all right? <laughs> and I promise you, we'll talk gospel, all right? Okay, let's say, Brother Leo, then we go to um, Sister Diane. Last um, point. I was going to say, since Jesus said we we're going to be worshipping in spirit and in truth, I always think like we're going to be like nomads in a way, moving from place to place. Mm -hmm. like Not like from house to house, like traveling everywhere, but like moving from church to church, like going to different people's places, like someone's house and all, mm -hmm. like nomads in a way. Like yes. going like, from church to someone's house, like even if they don't even have a house, they can set up on a, like in a, in a park and all, like. Uh, it's doable, it's doable, but we have to understand, you see when God calls his people, thank you, Brother Leo, uh, it's a mission. For example, evangelists, you ain't going to be buried in a house necessarily daily. In fact, some of the prophets of God, they were forbidden from having families. For example, Jeremiah. Uh, he just had to keep moving, not even get married. Do you see what I'm saying? So 
even Jesus himself, he, he didn't raise a family. The Apostle Paul, same, where the daily task became the spreading the word of God. However, if you look at how these guys moved, they relied, same like Jesus Christ, we'll study this in a minute, they relied on people to have stable houses that you could visit. So any which way you slice it or dice it, you have to understand that that's God's plan for his people as a church and as a community of believers. Uh, Sister Diane. As children of God, should not have a member inside the church that is home. Absolutely. Our home should be our brothers Thank and you. sister home. If I don't have nowhere for myself, Sister Tracy's address should be mine. Amen. Sister Liz's address should be mine. Amen. So I should be able to locate it. It is the responsibility of the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. To take up such one Absolutely. and give them stability. Absolutely. Thank you, Sister Diana. We end on that note. Whew. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> All right. We're perfect online. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. So we are a brother's keeper. Amen? Yeah. We're a brother's keeper. I hope no one's um, taking the wrong message away this morning about what we think of each other going through different challenges in terms of homelessness or transitioning between um, accommodations. Yeah? All right, okay. Question number one. In fact, this is what the introduction says, that once you have a church building, people become lazy because we feel like that's task finished. Everyone's here now. Oh, I brought you to Christ, so that's it done. I don't need to socialize with you no more. I don't need to see where you're at. I don't need to check on you no more. I don't need to even see if you are um, fully fed on water, I mean socially now. So the house of God could become a place for laziness where we just feel like no more needs to be done. Do you see what I'm saying? So I hope we do as Sister Diane says just now that we check on each other and that we see that each other is progressing in Jesus' name. Amen? I hope that your soul prospers, that you prosper even as your what? soul prospers. Amen? So there has to be some prosperity in all its guises. Question one. Read Luke chapter 19, verse 5. It should be on the screens. Comment on whether Jesus' indication to Zacchaeus is also for us. So I want you to look at this interaction of Jesus with Zacchaeus. And I want you to tell me if it's an indication for us now as people of God. Okay, Sister Joan is going to read for us. Uh, yeah, Ruth, uh, Luke 19, 5. Mm -hmm. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Thank you, Sister Joan. So remember Zacchaeus. Who was Zacchaeus? Anyone want to tell us about Zacchaeus? Okay, Brother Leo, if you just wait for the microphone, and we go back to Sister Joan in a minute. Zacchaeus was a small person. Short, yes. Um, I don't remember the whole story. <laughs> um, and he was a um, public official as well, he was wasn't he? He was a public official as well. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think a taxpayer. I don't know. Tax <laughs> or collector, more like. But yes, thank you, Brother Leo. All right, okay. Brother Honor, I'll see the hand, but let's go back to Sister Joan just to clear this one up. Thank you, Brother Leo. So we know who Zacchaeus was. Short in stature, but a public official, but was determined to see Jesus. And Jesus, when Jesus had come to the place, he looked up, he climbed in a tree, do you remember? And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy what? House. Okay, Sister Joan, you read the scripture. The verse. So I'd like you to tell us, as the question asks, comment on whether Jesus' indication to Zacchaeus is also for us today. Um, yes, sir. Um, is the microphone on, please? Yes, I believe that it is for us today. In what way? In what regard? In the sense that um, we must always have our house readily available okay. when um, a, a situation maybe like this may arise, um, when someone needs to come to our house for fellowship. Okay. Or, or prayer, or, or something to eat, anything like that. Okay. Okay. But yeah, we should always Good have point. our house as a Christian readily available. Okay, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Joan. Okay, Sister Diane, if you just wait for the microphone as well. So, comment on how this is an indication for us now in Jesus' interaction with Zacchaeus. Okay. Um, as we know, um, Zacchaeus was a big man. He was a rich mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. And um, I think here it's relevant to us where, in the sense where um, 
some of us are in our pumps and our pride. And some of us, um, you know, we have a lot of gain that we gain. But mm. the, the scripture here is saying that Jesus said, come down. Come down off your high places where you are and come because you need to have me in your life. Okay, good so, point, good point. So you're saying yeah. even metaphorically, we need to come down from where we're at we are, yes. to Jesus' level. Good Jesus. point as well. Yeah. Good point, good point, good point. Humble yourself. Thank you, yes, Sister Tracy. Sister. You wake up now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so good point. Okay, so we see metaphorically as well, it applies to us that we need to come down from our high places. Yeah. Uh, here's another one for you as well, which um, stood out for me, is that many times we see interacting with people's houses only are poor people sit set up. But this is a rich man. Do you see what I'm saying? We only see opening doors or going around people's houses only a poor people set up where, where only the poor should be invited around or they should be catered for or they should only come to my house because I'm in a better state. Do you see what I'm saying, brethren? And many people get intimidated by wealth. Do you not get that feeling as well? Here's another example for you as well. Is that Jesus Christ, in all his um, dealings, he invited himself over. Do you not find that interesting? Many of us would think someone is a bit out of order if they invite themselves around, like, I'm coming over to yours tonight, Brother Ronald. You think, oh, well, I didn't invite you. What are you talking about? We should, we should welcome that just as much as if we had invited them. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah, come down. So, our sister, so thank you, sister. Give Sister Diane a round of applause. That's true. There's a classic example of coming down. Humble yourself. Uh, Sister Liz, I see the hand. Mm-hmm. Invite himself around to your house. You being a child of his, he invite himself over to a person not even accepting Thank yet. You. Okay, round of applause so for Sister Liz. Wait, Sister Liz. Wait for the round of applause. Round of applause for <laughs> <you> as well. <laughs> so, so therefore, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it this way is that being a, a house uh, worship, we don't have to invite you. I can say to the person who I'm worship, um, witnessing to, I'm inviting myself to your house. Thank you, thank you, You know, thank you. and very maybe, good that, point. maybe the person maybe, maybe feel more comfortable in their own settings. Very good point, very good point. Welcome back, Sister Merva and the brethren that came in just now as well. All right, very good point, actually. In fact, that's the fundamental of what we're studying. It's not just pair to pair in terms of Christians to Christians and friends to friends, because many people just stuck within that comfort zone where all you want to deal with is just the people that you know. In fact, as you know, it's part of sociology where people surround themselves with like-minded people, people from the so usual socioeconomic background, people that don't want to feel threatened by wealth or threatened by an ex-person's situation, or they don't want to be in a situation where you have to drink from a dirty cup or sleep in a bed that's not exactly nice. Do you see what I'm saying? They, they, like to be in the comfort zone. So here is it, as Sister Liz said just now, Zacchaeus wasn't even a Christian. He wasn't part of this movement. In fact, people didn't like tax collectors and public officials back in those times. But Jesus associated himself with him long before. And that's what we need to do as well. In fact, I find it very telling, actually. There's a lot of people that is far more receptive of people. I could chill with a non-Christian guy even easier than some Christians. Do you not see that? Muslims would even invite me over for food or give me food. I remember, <laughs> anyway, let me not talk these stories, but you, you, I find some, some people or some cultures are far more receptive than even people that's promoting Christianity. And we need to address that. All right, thanks, Reverend Sister Joanne, and then we go to question two. Go on. That's right. Um, I don't know if there's anything in, in this, but I'll, I'll just... wait for the readouts. Excuse me. I'll wait for the readouts online as well if you can't put them on screen. So. Any points or co contributions that comes in, if you could... Just a quick question. Yes. Why do you think Jesus said to him, make haste? I don't know if there's anything in that, but could you just... I like that. And what's coming to me from what you said just now, or the point that you made, if you go to... Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Thanks for bringing this point out, Sister Joanne. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, please. Jesus made a profound teaching in Matthew chapter 5, which always stand out for me. He said, uh, I want you to find the bit where he says, if you've got a problem with a brother, uh, oh, verse 20, 
Start from verse 23 of Matthew 5. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother at ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come again and offer thy gift. Verse 25, agree with thine adversary quickly. You see that word again? Quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge delivered thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. And Jesus said, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the utmost farthing. In other words, till you pay the full fine, or serve the full prison sentence. The point is, what I get from this here, which is relevant to the question that you asked, is that some things are time sensitive, quickly, while he's in the way. In other words, while you have the opportunity to. Do you see? Many of us, we see letters come for a letter box, and we ignore it. And the deadline is coming, and you're going to get fined. Do you see what I'm saying? So help me, God. Right? <laughs> Do you see? But now, come quickly. Now is the opportunity. Jesus just passed in town this today. Do you see? So sometimes there's opportunities that knock at uh, your door. And Pastor Dennis shared this um, point a few years back. He said that he went to some, either some academic place, or I can't remember where he went. And there's some documents that you should get, and there was only one document left, like a first come first serve basis. And he spent all the time greeting and chatting to the lecturer or whoever it was, greeting and chatting. And a guy that came after him came literally straight and asked for the document, and he got it. And then when out of politeness now, he turned to the lecturer and asked, um, could I have one of the documents as well? And he said, no, that was the last one. So in other words, he was stood there talking all this time, but didn't ask for the key thing that he came for. Do you see what I'm saying? And I, I would like to think that's the point as well. Let's give Sister Joan a clap, please, brethren. That's the that's point, whether you realize it or not. That many times in people's life, people will spend all the time trying to help you, trying to dig you out of a situation, trying to talk to you about Christ, trying to talk to you about a better way, trying to give you an opportunity that you probably didn't have before. And you keep turning away, turning away, turning it down, saying tomorrow, maybe not now, maybe the next time. And you find every excuse in the book. But little do you know that it's never to be again. Do you see? So I like to think that's a very powerful point right there. Quickly, come down quickly. Let's, let's do business now. I need to come to your house. Amen? Quickly. Time sensitive. In fact, that's what they accused Jesus of. We're going to go to Lazarus in a minute. That, oh, it's been four days now and you didn't come. It takes the power of Jesus Christ to resurrect a situation if you miss the opportunity. Sister Diana, I saw the hand. Yeah. Okay, agree. Okay, in Jesus' name. Okay, thank you. Um, Sister Laverne, microphone, please, for benefit of our online audience as well. Okay, Sister Millie, wait for the microphone as well. Okay. Just so had what you said, um, you're yes, saying, um, like including the A's, well. said Isaiah yeah. 55, verse 6, he said, Seek the Lord while he may be born. Amen. Call ye upon him while he is. Amen. Today so, is the day. So basically, when he said, um, Lazarus, um, come down and make case, I am here now. So you, I'm um, here. So we have to see God while he can be formed. Because sometimes we're actually seeking him. Not that he's not always here, but he has been calling, calling too long. And we're not responding mm -hmm. to him while he's in our presence. No, so true. So said, make case while you can. Time sensitive. Yeah. Time sensitive. Thank you, Stella Vern. In fact, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 tells you this. Um, Remember now thy creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days draw near. In other words, before ill health, sicknesses, all sorts of dramas, life situations. In fact, many of you know that I've been trying to learn to play the saxophone. And I've had that saxophone for probably about 24 years now. A very long time. So embarrassing. Oh, you're very encouraging, Sister Tracy. <laughs> and I've never learned to play it properly. And I remember even my dad and my elder brother, they gave me a guitar when I was young and gave me an amplifier as well. And I've never really learned to play properly. I gave it to a guy. He learned to play and I gave him my guitar and gave him my equipment. I didn't even tell my parents about it, but that's something else. But it got to a point, and this affects a lot of men especially, where there are certain things or skills that you should learn in a time-sensitive manner. You become embarrassed about learning it later on. I'm even embarrassed to stand in public and play a bad note. Does that make sense? And that put a dampener on my learning abilities. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So maybe I need therapy. <laughs> no, no, but you get what I'm trying to say, brethren. Many men, for example, when you should learn riding a bike at the age of teenage, right? Now you become embarrassed that you can't even balance. You feel like a boy all over again. It embarrasses you that you don't even bother touching it. When you should learn to drive, for example, when you should learn to swim. Does that make sense? 
before you can't no longer. A lot of other examples I could give you that's very time sensitive. Parents, time when you should be, as the Bible says, um, training the children, when you should be going for swims, for walks, for fun. But now that you become so busy with cares of life and you have bills to pay and council tax and bailiff letters and all sorts of dramas. You haven't got to, <laughs> I don't even have time to pick up the saxophone. Do you see what I'm saying? Times when I was free to memorize memory verses and learn the Bible, learn the scriptures more. Do you see what I'm saying? Now you get ordained into office in the church, you're dealing with so much issues that you don't even have time to do that in the basic manner. Does that make sense? Now you have to deal with, use other strategies to achieve the same thing that probably takes more effort. Does that make sense? That's why the word says that. Now, now, thank you. Sister Millie. Microphone, please. Yeah, I just want to ask this question. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've mentioned about um, Jesus telling Zacchaeus to come down mm -hmm. quickly, make haste. And I'm just thinking that Zacchaeus had a need. And because he was short in stature, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's why he climbed the tree. Because um, in those days, there were throngs and throngs of people Mm -hmm. um, with Jesus. So because he wanted to have this appointment with Jesus, I'm thinking that's why he climbed the tree. And Thank I'm you. not thinking that it's because he think that he's rich or no, no, anything. No, 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 no. But we said metaphorically. Right. So we said we made that distinction earlier. Right. It's metaphorical, not so because I'm he's... I'm just thinking that Zacchaeus had a need to yes. see Jesus. Well, just before you came in earlier, Sister Millie, a few points that was made by Sister Joan and Sister um, Diane spoke about mindset 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 that's one of the most powerful thing that we have mindset the next question is going to speak to something very profound as well but i won't, I won't preempt it we'll wait for it but mindset he heard that jesus was in town and was curious he wanted to see him curious and that's what drove him up into the tree and he was going to make some sort of effort to overcome his his physical shall i say inability to see because of his height as you said so it's a crowd he wants to do something that gave him a head and shoulders above the crowd, so he climbed in the tree. And I'm saying to you, the word mindset effect was on the point of homelessness earlier when we spoke about some godly contentment. It's great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Mindset. If you have the mindset to achieve something, it will transform your situation literally overnight. Believe me, you'll do what it takes. You'll decide, okay, I need a tool to achieve it. I need to put myself in the situation to achieve it. I'll do, you remember the woman with the issue of blood. If I could just touch the hem of the garment. Do you see? Mindset. Mindset is a big driver in many people's situations. So in relevance to the topic of the lesson, as for me and my house, we will serve. If you have the mindset, for example, where if you're in homelessness now, whatever the situation is, and you make all these promises that, oh, if I get a house, then I'll serve. And then when God gives you the house, you forget about it. Or if I get the house, I'll open it up to homeless people. I'll do all this, I'll do that. I'll bake the church a nice cake and bring it in. And then when you get the house, you forget about this. Mindset is a key driver behind what we're studying this morning. But let's go even further. Mindset has to do with some of our prejudices or hang-ups. For example, we think that I don't want to invite no one in the house because I remember one guy that was trying to find um, someone to come to his house. Let's just keep it simple. And he started putting up his keys and phones once he see who the person was that came through the door. In other words, you already start assuming that this person is going to steal my stuff. Mindset. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Mindset. It will make us feel like, no, I'd rather meet you at church than meet you in my house. Mindset. So thanks for bringing out that point. Question number two. Let's all move on. If we agree to move on, let's all say amen. amen. I want to hear it louder. Amen. Question two. Our home can become a haven of salvation for many. Like our hearts, what blessing will be given to us if we open the doors of our home? Question. Statement. Our homes, our home can become an, a haven of salvation for many. Like our hearts, what blessing will be given to us if we open the doors of our home? Sister Laverne earlier made a clarification between physical home and spiritual body, and physical body being spiritual home as well. Okay, Brother Leo, if you wait for the microphone, Brother Hunt is going to um, make his point. Uh, if you were 
not born into a Christian home, you could save your family. You could be salvation, like, for your own family. Okay. Okay, so there's a point that preempts even the reading, but that's a good point as well. So, as he says, if you weren't born in a Christian home, he could become the savior for his family. For example, you could be that one person that brings Christ back into your household, even yeah. before you open the door to external people. So that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, here's another point for you, but let's read Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, and then you'll see a key point that's coming out of this here. Revelation 3, verse 20. Brother, br let's ask... Okay, go on. Okay, I was going to ask you to read for us. Go ahead. That's fine. Read for us. No. Okay, Brother De La Vega, if you could read for us, please. Brother De La Vega, if you could read um, the chapter, the verse on the screens, please. If you wait for the microphone, it's behind you. Brother De La Vega. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Um, Behold, I, st I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Thank you. Amen. So here's a question for you. What blessing will be given to us if we open the doors of our home? Before we even go further, okay, Brother Saeed, if let you make your point. Oh, I was going to say um, there's a level of intimacy um, that comes with opening up your home to someone because it's kind of like you're sharing who you are in a sense okay. as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. In, in fact, I would even say it does more than you could ever speak with your words. Does that make sense? In other words, you could stand there and speak the gospel all day long in the middle of the high street, but just that one act of opening your home to that person, even without saying another word, it could have far more of an impact or speak or as I say, actions speak louder than words. Brother Arnold, if you wait for the microphone as well. Thank you, Brother Saeed. Mm -hmm. Earlier, I said um, when the guy knocked on my door and um, asked me for a pair of shoes, mm -hmm. remember, I couldn't believe that the man knocked my door and asked me for a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. That's very unusual. How dare I not give him a pair of shoes? You know, man could have asked me for water. I would never knock your door and ask you. But I've, it's like being tested being tried, are you really for real? Yeah? I had no choice. Mm -hmm. The man said, somebody steal him shoes. Him not have no shoes. And not my door. So I'm glad I was able to do that because that is hospitality. Right there. Yeah? Thank you so much for making that point. Do you know, that's an act of faith, by the way, because a shoes is not just a personal item. You'd have to assume that that, that door is going to be a male and that shoe size is going to be similar to my feet size. Do you see what I'm saying? So when someone do that to me even that request is a big act of faith does that make sense brethren it's a big act of faith but here's the key question the question says what blessing will come to your house if we open our doors if the doors of our home so i want us to focus on the the blessing of the home 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 ho, ho, or home owner's side i got tongue twisted there what blessing will come tell me if you pass it to sister Liz, please thank you so, so, I, either, 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 okay. either, because this question, let me just clarify the question again. Okay, okay, Sister Liz, let's come back to you in a minute, but let's just, for the purposes of the class. Okay. okay. Sister Diane asks, for the purposes of the wider class, are we speaking about a physical home or a body being the spiritual home? Yes. So, go ahead. Okay, uh, um... According to Revelation 3, verse 20, mm -hmm. it said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice mm -hmm. and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding from this verse is that um, it's not talking about our physical door. Okay. It's talking about our spiritual life, our heart. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we are going through so many things and we just shut ourselves in. So, um, this, the, 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 the scripture is saying to us, Jesus is standing there. Open your heart. Allow God to come in. Mm -hmm. he, will, he will take over. He will suck with you. So the blessing that we'll have, Jesus would live and reign in our heart if we just open our heart and accept him Thank in you. our life. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the spiritual point. But here's a key point for you. Yeah. Let's go back to the initial statement. It says our home can yeah. become a 
and you even can, you can okay, okay sister Liz sister Liz wanna sister Liz wants to um, okay sister Liz okay thank you sister uh, Diane the, the, what I'm looking at with the home mm -hmm. where is the, the scripture says here that if you open up the door and, mm -hmm. and knock I, I it, it dragged me back to um, what we will have is the blessing and the presence of the Lord in our house. Mm -hmm. I, I go back, way back when the Ark of the Covenant was going around, and when it dwells in a certain person's home, there was an extra blessing and we'll prosperity. Come, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that. That's the next question. Ah. Say no more. Say no more. That's the next question. Okay. See the, okay, I see the hand. Let's take Brother Lady and Brother Ronald. But Sister Liz, I'm not shutting you down, but I'm saying that's the next question. So let's save it for the next question. Brother Lady. Um, are the, the, uh, be this verse as, as your heart, like the door to your heart. Okay, because, yes. Just, uh, um, your house could be meaning your heart and the people's hearts, not like a physical house, mm -hmm. like a spiritual house into your uh, heart. Like, if I, like, for example, if you hear Jesus' voice, you would let him into your heart because that's like a doorway to you. Thank you. Then to other people. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Brother Lee. You absolutely linked the two just now, which I was going to link for us. So Brother Lee says, your heart becomes a doorway to him, Jesus, and to other people. So even if you go from physical home to spiritual home being your body, it's the same. You become the salvation for other people. You could rescue other people. So once you let Jesus in, whether that be in the physical home, whether that be the spiritual home, because he has to start from the spiritual home first anyway, before it becomes physical in the physical bricks and mortar, you become salvation or savior for other people, small s, obviously. There's only one savior, capital S, Jesus Christ. But as God told Israel in Judges, I sent you many saviors, small s. Many people that help you out of situations. You become that person. In other words, as the question says, our home can become a haven of salvation for many. You become, once you let Jesus into you, you become that place of refuge, of rescue for many other people as well. Does that make sense? Even long before they knock on the physical door or ring your ring doorbell. Do you see what I'm saying? Make sense? So any which way you slice it or dice it, that's all the beauty of the word of God. In If you apply it in metaphors, apply it physical, apply it spiritual, any which way the word of God fulfills itself in all its forms. Does that make sense? Amen? Okay, let's go one step further. Okay, that's see the point here. Quick point. Behold, I stand at the door. If um, I'm at home, Mm -hmm. and someone knocks on my door. Um, if I don't hear the door, I ain't going to open it. Mm -hmm. So we got to listen. There's that part that says, if any man hear my voice. Mm -hmm. So we cannot make God come into our heart if we don't first hear him. So I think that's a okay. point to be made. Thank you. How do we hear God's voice? Remember in Luke chapter, sorry, in Romans chapter 17, how could they hear without a preacher? And how could they, without the word? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word. So thank you for um, highlighting that point as well. So hearing creates opportunities. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Now, here's a key point for us before we move to the final question. This is good point. Okay, okay. Thanks for giving me. Here's a key point for you. It starts with the first word of the memory verse, which is Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Sister Morris, morning and welcome. Blessed Sabbath, long time no see. <laughs> Choose for yourself this day whom we will serve. Choose. Here comes a key point here that God observes. The authority of the threshold, literally, of your door. Whether that be the door of your mind or the physical door of the house. If you notice, there's a massive distinction between the powers of the state and the powers of your house. Am I right? Are you following me? A massive distinction between the powers of the state and the powers of your actual house. If you notice, the powers of the state stops at your front door. Am I not right? Where the police can't just step in without a warrant. They can't even, whatever laws they want to enforce, they can't visit it upon the house unless you, as the homeowner, agrees to it. or grant access. So here's the same thing with Jesus Christ. He says, my authority stops there. It's an active choice you have to make to accept me or accept what I'm about. Do you not get that from it? Do you not get that? Let's read it again. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. 
Do we get that name? Is it there? Okay, let's read it together. One, two, three. Behold. Okay, so what do you get from that? Do you not see where Pastor Johnson always say, God is a gentleman. He's not just going to kick down your front door and force you to believe. Do you not get that from, do you not get that from this? That he has manners. <laughs> yeah, Jesus has manners. Do, do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus has manners. So I'll suggest to us, brother, I'll see the hand. So I'll suggest to us that it's the same way we should treat people, where we don't force people... We don't try to push salvation on people. Don't try, as some people do, use church as a battering ram that you're going to go to hell. Look at you. You are this and that and all sort of stuff. Jesus is not about that. He's not about that. In fact, the easiest way to win someone over is to leave them, let them be. Let them see the need for themselves to want to want it. Does that make sense? Make sense? But kingdom language now... God's authority is actually giving way to your authority, the authority of your mind. Does that make sense? That you have to want to want to let him in, if that makes sense. Brother Ronald, then we move to question three. I've got three minutes left. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If mm -hmm. any man hears my voice and open the door. Remember, you have to be inside your house. Okay. <laughs> that as well. You have to be in your yeah. right mind. That you as have well. to be inside somewhere. <laughs> we we're, we're, Earlier, when we were talking about homeless, you can't be inside nowhere we like that. Okay. The spirit will come to you in a different sense. But remember, this is not even the postman or somebody. Somebody going to come knock your door. Make sure you're prepared. Thank you, yeah? Ronald. Don't have the television on too low, or the head <laughs> for on your head and you can't hear because of the important message coming. You're absolutely right. right. You're absolutely yeah. right. And if we, if we translate that metaphor as well, Many people are dealing with so many other business and so many other things that occupy their mind that they're not home to stick with that metaphor. Does that make sense? Round of applause for Brother Ronald, please. Yeah, so a very powerful metaphor there. You have to be at home, be in your right mind, or occupy yourself in your own business, in other words, right? Then you could have way for other businesses. Now, there's some points from question two. It says, what blessing was given to us if we opened the door of our home? I deliberately left out some of the blessings because the final question, question three, is going to actually elaborate on that. Question three says, discuss what happened at Obedidam's house, or Obedidam's home, when he had the Ark of the Testimony at his home. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. What will God do in our homes if we open the doors for Bible study and worship meetings? These are giving us two examples of activities. Okay, who's going to read for us? Who's going to read for us? Oh, Brother Said, okay, if you read for us on the media corner, please. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 10 to 12 says, So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edon, mm -hmm. the Gittites. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom, and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of God, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David with gladness. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Said. Okay, so we see here now, what, 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 what do we see here? It says, Discuss what happened at Obed Edom's house. What happened at this house? What happened? What, what was, sorry, Brother, if you wait for the microphone, make your comments on the mic, please, for the online viewers. Like an abundance of loving, abundance of blessing. Abundance of loving, abundance of blessing. But Everything, we have to understand, thank you. Every good and pleasant thing is from above. C could we say abundance of inconvenience as well? His household was blessed. No, no, I know that, but I'm just saying, let's back it up a bit. Because I want you to understand that. Making room in your house for the Ark of the Covenant or any physical. Imagine someone brings, I don't know, that's even small, but I get the point though. But let's say someone bring like six wardrobes or whatever size it was, or bring a car and say, store it up for us. At the same time, 
my oh, guy Obedin must have been blessed because remember, oh, if yeah. they trouble the ark, you could have dropped down. No, tomorrow. no, absolutely. We'll come yeah. to these points in a minute. But so he was a responsible person. He loved the Lord and he was blessed anyway for that to be inside his house. Thank you. You can't just have it. You can't touch it like that. You can't just. Yeah, you have to be blessed by the Almighty. You have to be anointed. Uh, absolutely, because the other verse is going to clarify that as well. But we can't divert into that today. So, so he took the Ark of the Covenant home, knowing the risky run as well to touch it, because it's only the priesthood that should have moved it. Do you remember? So, inconvenience. You could say maybe how many of us could take in a homeless person? What's the relationship? Daughter, mother. I didn't know you had a daughter, but yes, good. Pastor, oh, okay, oh, interesting. Welcome, by the way, welcome. Brethren, Brother Morris's daughter and granddaughter, uh, welcome. God bless you. Um, and condolences, the loss of your mom, but we'll address these points later on when Pastor Johnson is here anyway. Uh, so, here we go. He knew the risk. How many of us could take in a homeless person and not know the risk, for example, as we discussed earlier? How many of us could commit to feed a... Uh, uh, hungry person I think but oh my gosh it's going to cost me more my food bill no so he knew the risk he knew the inconvenience and I just want to say to you even studying the word of God might seem inconvenient because normally you'd rather watch the telly wouldn't it but there's a blessing to be had brother Leo see the hand brother Leo I was going to add a little bit of context to yes, this, go on, this go on, slide go. before we like context um before this actual verse um, someone touched the Ark of the Covenant, which he was not meant to, and God struck him down because mm -hmm. only the uh, priests were meant to touch it. Yes. And um, uh, he, David was displeased with the person as well. God was angry mm -hmm. with David, I think. I'm reading it, but I don't want to extend the whole thing. Oh, no, that's fine. Um... God smote him down because of his error, because he, like, everyone at this point knew what the laws of the ark were. Um, like, it was the most important thing to carry around. Like, if they didn't have that during battle, then it was a loss. It was, um, that's my point. Oh, no, that's fine. Basically, that's quite well made. before this verse, it's like, someone dies by touching it. They went to someone's house for three months. And, uh, Abedidam's house for three months. Yeah. Now, here's, what, here's a point for you, just to clarify what you said just now. The Ark of the Covenant should only be moved by the priesthood. In other words, the priest should carry it. Yes. God says carry it on your shoulders with the handles that comes with it as well. They put it on the back of an oxen cart. In other words, let's make it easy. It's a bit like many of us now. I, I'm guilty of that as well. I'd rather um, give someone like 10 pounds or go buy some food more than sit there all day, speak with them. Do you see what I'm saying? Just an easy way out. So there's many lessons we could learn from it where... It's not what God instructs us, but it's so easy because it's just rather, just rather do that. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why God was angry. He wasn't angry because someone just touched it as random as that. It's because they deliberately ignored what he instructed them to do. Does that make sense? So that's why God was angry. All right, so Abedidam was the one that says, all right, do you know what? Seeing that we can't bring it up to Jerusalem, no, let's stay at my house until the government sort out the problems in terms of restoring the priesthood and organizing themselves all over again. So the final question says, what will God do in our homes if we open the doors for Bible study and worship meetings? Question to the class. He'll supply what? Answer on the microphone, please. Microphone, microphone Sister Joanne, if the microphone is in that area, neck of the woods. <laughs> Whatever you're lacking, God um, will provide. For instance, um, you open your house um, to a person to worship God and you're short of, just physically short of like food, juice mm -hmm. and stuff. God will provide you. Don't have to worry about certain things. God will bless you abundantly Amen. once you open his, your house to do his work. Oh. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So there's a blessing to be had, brethren. Amen. So I hope that we get or got that from the study. My house for the house of service of God. So if you open your house, not that you're doing it for a blessing or you're doing it for something in return. Do you see? But is that my microphone? Sorry. It's not like you're doing it for something in return, but there's a blessing to be had. Make sense? Yes. Okay, Sister Diane will get the last point, then we we'll close. And please. just a little point here. Okay, go on. Um, as per the scripture, we can mm -hmm. see that um, the, the hawk here in, um, 
in Samuel's was the presence of God. It, it represents the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And Obedium opened his door to the presence of the Lord, and the blessing was in his house. Anywhere the presence of the Lord Blessings uh, were, to be had. the blessing comes Amen. there. Round of applause to Sister yes. Diane, please. Yes. Come on, brother. Round of applause. Yes. So it wasn't just the any old box. is what it represented. So as you clarified... Anywhere the presence of God goes is blessing. So anywhere you open your mind, your heart, open anything to the presence of God, there's a blessing to be had. It's as simple as that. Are we in agreement? If you're in agreement, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, from the introduction, you saw where many of the people in, in paragraph chapter 1 that actually opened a house, Matthew done that. We see where Cornelius done that. We see where Lydia done that. We see where Crispus done that. We see where Zacchaeus done that. We saw Lazarus' his family did, doing that as well. From the Old Testament, we saw where the Shulamite woman that built um, the prophet Elisha, uh, a, a room, a house, and a bed, offered a bed as well to the prophet. She got a son out of it, not from the prophet, but, <laughs> but from God. So we see where um, blessing follows. Amen? Amen? Conclusion. Wherever he goes... In, sorry, wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a larger upper room furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. Mark 14 tells you this. Let's start preparing our homes to be places where Christ will meet with his disciples in Jesus' name. Reverend, let's not just talk the talk, but let's, by God's grace, walk the walk, and invite me over for a meal later on. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as I hand back to the moderator. Amen.